Thank you. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. And so thanks to the organizers for uh, having me speak here. And uh, um, let me make a disclaimer. So I guess I'm on the abstract categorical side uh, of most of you, if, uh, almost everybody here. So uh, on the one hand, I will try to uh, take it easy and start uh, with some uh, basics. On the other hand, uh, this is uh, probably the most categorical talk you will hear during the week. So uh, enjoy. Uh, <laughs> Um, okay, so uh, what I want uh, gonna say, you know, there will be some preliminaries as I already said uh, on the newer uh, stuff. Most of it will be joined with Martina Rovelli, and depending on how time goes, uh, I will also comment on our joint work with Martina Rovelli and Julie Bergner, who is here. OK, so we want uh, to uh, talk about equivalences and higher categories. So I should give you s some sense of what, it, uh, what higher categories might be. And uh, there are many different un answers to this. And I will give you a uh, fluffy answer first. And then we will we'll go to uh, more definitional answers uh, in a moment. So what should a higher category be? And given that I'm speaking to many homotopy theorists, um, I would start with weak higher categories. I will uh, change in a, uh, in a half an hour, let's say, to a slightly different perspective. But let me start with weak higher categories. And uh, also, this question has plenty of answers. I'm going to actually not uh, be weak in the most general sense. I want to start with infinity n categories. OK, so uh, what kind of object am I expecting? So it's some kind of weak generalization of categories. So this we can uh, agree upon. So it will have something like objects. And in my graphical calculus, uh, it will be always dots. Uh, it will have something like morphisms. But now I will stress, because I'm going higher in a second, that these are one morphisms. And in my graphical calculus, these are going to be arrows. And you know, if I would be defining for you what a category is, this would be the basic datum you start with. You have some objects, you have some morphisms, and then you uh, start defining uh, operations with those. Uh, but now I want to uh, do something more fancy. I would allow also two morphisms. Uh, and I should uh, mention I will use a synonym, uh, one cells, two cells, and so on. So you can make a difference between those notions. But for me, for today, this, uh, these are just synonyms. OK, so what are these supposed to be? Now we are looking at parallel one morphisms. And uh, now we want to say, well, they're not quite equal. Uh, or they're not quite, uh, but they're related by something. And this something is now a two morphism. And now I can just uh, keep going. I think I can still draw three for you. Once again, uh, there's, there's no particular uh, reason to stop at three, uh, other than I'm uh, bad in drawing more than this. So that. If you have two parallel two morphisms, you can relate them again via three uh, morphism. And uh, in a way, this idea is very much uh, familiar to homotopy theorists. Namely, um, if you are doing homotopy theory well, sometimes you say, OK, my morphisms, uh, my usual maps are not quite equal. They are homotopic. So there you would say, OK, I have a homotopy between them. And you know, uh, as you know, 
uh, sometimes it's important to, uh, which homotopy you have actually picked. So sometimes you want to say, OK, these two homotopies are actually homotopic where something uh, even uh, more fancy. OK, but even if I would uh, have defined a category for you, well, it's not just objects and um, one morphisms. As we teach our undergrads, you don't stop at this. You usually need to define something like a composition, and then uh, you need to uh, impose some axioms. But um, this is the first thing you start with. So you would expect some. And now my weakness also comes in, weak. And I will be very vague on this for a long time. Um, composition. of um, all uh, n morphisms, so sorry, all k morphisms for all dimensions k. And let me say what it means along lower dimensional um, morphisms, uh, sources, and targets in a second. But uh, actually, uh, if you have, if you remember even the fundamental group, the, this weakness in the composition is something you are very much familiar with. Uh, if you uh, remember concatenation of paths, uh, you already don't expect, well, this path composed with this path and with that path. Um, you know, you can pick different, in order to compose even two of them, you can pick different parameterization of your interval. And you know, it's somewhat standard to say, OK, this is the first half and this is the second half. But apart from our convenience, there is no particular reason for this. And uh, once you, uh, even uh, for uh, concatenation of paths in the fundamental group, uh, you quickly uh, encounter, the, well, this is not going to be strictly associative, because if you scale this to half and then uh, make this one half, well, the numbers don't quite watch out, uh, work out. Um, and in particular, you are only associative up to something. And this something is a higher dimensional homotopy. Well, this is something which I define to be a two cell. So we want weak. Well, usually you would require for a category to have something associative and something unital. So I'm still requiring this. But I'm requiring this up to higher <laughs> morphisms. So as we just seen in the example of the fundamental group, this works fine for um, homotopies, uh, well, to, for concatenation of paths. Oh, this is not quite associative, but it's associative up to what I just declared to be a two morphism. And uh, actually, uh, you know, you can say, well, that's it. But uh, if you want to make this really uh, into something manageable, well, you can divide by it. This is what you did for the fundamental group. You divide out this relation. But you get more information if you keep this. But then you want to uh, remember that this is coherent in a way itself. So you will get homotopies between homotopies between homotopies. So this leads you to infinite amount of information, which is a thing you need to take care of ordering somehow. And this is what we are going to do. So the infinity in this infinity n requires, uh, re, uh, re, um, talks about uh, infinite amount of coherences. Such, um, such like these homomorphisms. Hmm. 
But there's something, um, the, you know, I, I explained the infinity to you. I should rather explain the n to you. And uh, in my example, n was really bad. It was 0. Um, it w it's asking, well, uh, when uh, should I think uh, of a morphism as invertible or non-invertible in some sense? And you know, this sense will be this sense of equivalences, which will come to eventually. But um, when should I think of a morphism as being invertible? And for paths, well, a path is, in a sense, in this weak coherent sense, always invertible. I can just go backwards. So, um, um, the example I just gave you is an infinity zero category. But uh, instead, something you're really familiar with and uh, y you usually call just infinity category is infinity one categories in this language. And so what does this refer to? Well, uh, you, uh, if you say you're looking at homotopy of continuous maps, you don't expect even up to homotopy to, for every continuous map to be invertible in any sense, right? Um, but uh, after this, you know, for homotopies between continuous maps, you do expect them to be invertible. And for homotopies between homotopies, you would also expect this. Um, of highest dimension, <coughs> um, dimension which are not supposed to be invertible, which might be non-invertible. So I, I gave you kind of two examples, which are probably familiar. And I'm not going to make these examples precise, but you know, paths in space. They correspond more or less to an infinity zero category of, uh, of this topological space. So everything is going to be invertible, whereas um, Continuous maps between spaces they correspond to an infinity one category, and this is what you use. Uh, well, m most of you would just call an infinity category, and well. Uh, if any of you happen to have opened a big uh, orange book, uh, it could, uh, usually talks about infinity categories. And uh, in my language, this would be an infinity one category. Uh, and uh, usually, it's also not uh, as fluffy as I uh, described to you. Uh, and it's formulated in the language of quasi-category. Let me come back to this in a moment. OK, so enough of fluffiness for now. Uh, how can you make any of this precise in any sense? Is it going to stop somehow? <laughs> uh, well, I hope it's uh, OK there. And well, as for any a nice mathematical concept, there's a variety of ways to do so. Um, and uh, one of them would be just in terms of um, homotopy theories, so to speak, or in terms of those infinity categories. So uh, one of them would be in terms of infinity categories. And you know it sounds paradoxical because uh, in order to define what infinity categories are, I'm using what infinity categories are. Um, but uh, you can make uh, proper sense out of this. Uh, and in terms of infinity categories, there is a way. And this is due to Gapnen and Hauk saying in the, you know, there are uh, several approaches, but the one I'm uh, referring to is due to Gapnen and Hauk saying. 
uh, to say um, infinity category uh, weakly enriched in infinity and minus one categories. Okay, so how uh, so, uh, this now gives uh, opens the door for induction. Sorry. Uh, okay, I need to uh, if I'm trying to do some uh, kind of induction, I'd rather have an induction start. So uh, I told you paths in a space form an infinity zero category, and indeed uh, you can make precise that this is actually an equivalence of homotopy theories. So you would think of infinity zero categories as just spaces. If you want something more model dependent, something more concrete, uh, and, uh, if you are an expert, uh, you can uh, set this up as uh, underlying infinity category of uh, the model structure, of, uh, of the Kahn-Kuhl model structure on simplicial sets. But if it does not speak to you, don't worry. It's, you, uh, you think about spaces as being infinity uh, zero categories. Underlying uh, infinity category of Kahn-Kuhl model structure. On simplicial sets. Um, you, uh, no, uh, this is uh, sufficient for anything I'm going to say in the talk, I think. Okay, so I uh, did uh, an induction start. Well, I want to tell you now somehow I want to, en to enrich, uh, so ignore weekly for a second. Infinity one category would be enriched in infinity zero category. So it means I have some set of objects and between any two objects and now I have a mapping space of uh, morphisms between them and in a space I can then say again what it means for two morphisms to be homotopic and I can also perform this higher coherence operations. Um, so this is what infinity refers to but this most morphisms do not themselves have to be homotopic but you would like this composition which I was discussing before to be somehow uh, reasonable in terms of spaces. Okay so this would be uh, enriched but then you know uh, uh, it turns out uh, it, uh, the theory works out much better if you say weakly enriched instead and then you know infinity one categories are infinity categories enriched in spaces Well, uh, this is actually something tautological. This is just in, uh, going to turn out to be infinity categories. Well, it's tautological the way uh, I uh, phrased it. If you uh, phrase it differently, uh, there's non-trivial theory like coherent nerve uh, going uh, uh, being an equivalence of commodity theories going uh, behind the scenes, but uh, the way I phrase it, this is just a tautology. And then you can run your induction uh, to get any infinity two, infinity three, and so on. Okay, this is still vague, but a little bit less vague, I would say. And uh, but this gives you, a, a, if you read Kepner and Hauk, think this gives you a perfectly fine definition uh, for the infinity category of infinity n categories. And I should mention, this is actually a way to construct it, but uh, there's also a very nice description of what you actually should expect. And this is goes back to Balwick and Choma Pries. It 
so they give you axioms so you, uh, it's not just that we by accident constructed something which uh, you know looks like infinity n categories it has the cells which you can compose now uh, the, this actually satisfies the axiomatic nature of infinity uh, n categories and they actually also show that uh, given the axioms, there's some sort of uniqueness statement to this uh, for infinity n categories. And they're satisfied in this case. So th this infinity category is well defined. It's, uh, you can describe it even axiomatically. But, uh, and uh, that's all uh, really nice. Uh, but uh, as you uh, see from my uh, setup, uh, I want to uh, say but something. And um, there's uh, something which I really like in, uh, around these ideas. And uh, if you want to produce examples, you, this approach is, uh, you know, can be helpful, but uh, in order to produce examples in many contexts, you need something more concrete you can uh, get your hands on, and these are usually models. And I'm, no, I, I'm exaggerating, you can also produce examples with this way, but uh, for many examples, uh, we need to use models of infinity and categories. Okay, so what does that mean? I would like to uh, have something, and, uh, which is a model category actually, which presents this infinity category. For many purposes, the, uh, uh, this is uh, an overkill or maybe um, restricting myself unnecessary, but for many purposes, it's really convenient to have a model. Uh, want model categories and we want convenient model categories. Of infinity and categories. So let me come back to this example, which I uh, was uh, discussing before. Well, you know, the, uh, in a way, this was uh, way before me. Uh, I think first ideas go even back to Boardman and Folk. Then uh, the um, main statement, as I would uh, guess, is due to Jayal and really popularized by Lurie. But uh, a model in this sense, this precise sense, for infinity one categories. is given by quasi-category, by the model structure of quasi-categories. And you know, uh, for many constructions, you don't need to use this, but it's uh, a really nice th uh, thing where you can actually perform some combinatorics. You know, uh, I uh, used to call this, as most people do, the model structure. And that, uh, before I uh, learned uh, Jo uh, Yao himself in uh, this past summer, uh, I got acquainted with him. And you know, talking to him about the Jayao model structure seemed not quite the right thing. So I uh, decided to say model structure for quasi categories since then. Um, Okay. So this is an example of a model category which is, you know, really convenient to work with, and uh, which presents the infinity category of infinity ca one categories. Okay. Uh, so how do we go about this in more generality? You know, the uh, the original ideas, and once again, not from by us, but let me tell you about one particular which is dearest to my heart, uh, namely. Uh, the model structure for marked simplicial sets. Um, 
And at this place, I usually give your warning. Um, so the terminology underwent so many changes. I'm just going to stick stick to this one. But if you read a paper from uh, you know the, the ideas were around in the 70s already, and the, all the terminology is different. Um, okay, Mark Simplicio sets. Um, so what's that? This is actually a thing which I can define for you uh, uh, really. Uh, I can give you the underlying category of my uh, model category. I will assume you know what a simplicial set is. Then a marked simplicial set, well, this will be my notation, is a simplicial set X. Uh, and it will be equipped with a little tiny bit of extra data. So, you know, uh, this model for infinity one categories was in particular so convenient because it was based on simplicial sets. And we know very well how to work with those. And so uh, the idea here is, well, uh, we cannot, uh, at least uh, it's not a no-go theorem on my side, but uh, we cannot uh, you, uh, simplicial sets themselves, but instead uh, we can use a little bit more data here um, to, in order to encode what an infinity n category is. Together with a set for every n, so it will be called thin or marked simplices, so th t for thin um, of marked simplices, thin or marked I will use those as synonyms. And um, for n greater or equal than 1, containing all degenerate simplices. So this n is not the same as an infinity number in categories? So, uh, oh, sorry, k, okay. yeah, thank you, thank you. Thank you for pointing this out. So that's really all. No uh, further assumptions on my sets of thin uh, simplices. Um, you know, people sometimes ask if you think about it, it for a moment, it seems also improbable, but uh, it's not supposed to be closed into simplicial identities or anything. It's just a subset. Uh, and uh, a subset for every k uh, greater or equal than 1. So, uh, once again, a warning on terminology. There's the same name uh, in uh, Lurie, uh, Lurie's book and uh, Lurie's work. Uh, he means something slightly different. It's Super, uh, super similar, but there the k is said to be 1 only, and it works out for infinity 1 categories perfectly. But if you want to encode something higher, you need uh, all the higher uh, k. Um, this is roughly the, uh, the idea. And then uh, uh, morphisms are just maps of simplicial sets. Mapping things simplices to things simplices. So it preserves those subsets in a weakest possible sense. Okay, uh, so that's the definition. This is uh, the only honest definition, I guess, I will give you t today, and uh, maybe not the only one, but uh, one of the few. Um, but uh, um, this completes the definition for you. So the basic category is, pre uh, I would say, fairly easy. And so what you should think about, so how do I uh, envision this at all? So xk, uh, let me lift this board a little bit. So what you should think of is xk is for a moment a set of k morphisms. 
So this is not uh, honest anymore, as you see with the yellow color. Um, and I will be able to compose them to some extent. Um, so in my ha infinite uh, n category, which I'm trying to encode, okay, I uh, already told you I want to have something like k morphism, so xk will be this. And uh, it's subset txk supposed to be those of uh, uh, k morphisms which are equivalences. I haven't yet told you what this should be, um, but let me postpone this once again. But intuitively, those are invertible in some sense. Let me say invertible in a weak sense. So I need to provide you some uh, evidence that this definition uh, does have to do something which w w with what I told you before. So uh, let me start with a theorem, which you know the origins of this theorem. Okay, the very old versions go back to um, Robertson Street uh, in a slightly different context, and then uh, the theorem I'm referring to is uh, in parts due to verity and then Martin Rovelli and I have provided a, a new version of this theorem which uh, encodes more of the meaning of being infinity n category. So there's a model, so there will be a part which is a real mathematical theorem but then I will not exclude for you, you know, the zero morphisms as uh, uh, Thomas didn't. Uh, so I will uh, have uh, some particular, some uh, uh, announcement which uh, does not make sense right now. It will make sense uh, overall, I hope. There's a, a model structure uh, and this is underlying category for any n. So the, uh, the statement depends on n. Now, uh, thank you for pointing this out. Now this is really an n which I had before. So there will be one for every n, uh, for n greater or equal to zero, um, on Mark simplicial sets. Um, <coughs> okay, so where the um, core vibrations, let's say, are monomorphisms. So this is more of a technical statement, uh, part of the statement, but it, what it says is this model structure is fairly good to work with in some extent, to some extent, uh, monomorphisms. Okay, so this was a strict statement. There's a model structure for every n uh, greater or equal to zero. Um, and maybe let me, squeeze in indentation denoted. So if I want to stress which of those model structures I'm using right now, I will use infinity n. Uh, and uh, vibrant objects, so in this statement, I uh, know, you know, it makes some intuitive sense, but it's not a mathematical statement. Uh, so vibrant objects, encoding infinity and categories. So uh, slightly more precise, uh, still not a precise formulation. This tells you, well, they do have some uh, sets of k morphisms and this can morphisms can be composed. Uh, in some uh, weakly associative and uh, in some weak sense, some weakly associative and some weakly unital sense. So, uh, but I understand that this at the moment does not uh, sound like a statement to you. Um, okay, questions about this? Um, one question, like you said, somehow you don't expect this to be true without the marking, right? Like what about I mean, for n equals one? What so about n equals two? I think. Yeah, so um, let me comment on this. So, um, 
Okay, so for n equals one, I would say this is a more of an accident. Well, this is moving without me. No. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> um, so for n equals one, many things I would say fall together. So uh, things are more um, condensed there. So for n equals one, you can do both more or less, uh, or like you know, three uh, related things. So you can have a model structure for quasi categories. on simplicial sets themselves for quasi-categories. But uh, as I said, Lurie already upgrades this. You can also record what your equivalences are in an infinity one category. And this gives you a model structure and let me say on one marked simplicial sets so you only record uh, the marked simplices for dimension one, because those are the ones where you uh, ask yourself, well, some of them might be equivalent, but some of them might not. Uh, marked simplicial sets. And then, uh, so this is due to Lurie. This is due to Joyal. And developed further by Lurie and you know, th this model structure, I think this result is already due to verity in there. Uh, for infinity one, there's nothing funny happened. Model structure. Uh, Arc-simplicial set infinity one. They all turn out to be equivalent. Okay, so there's three things. And actually, you can write down the equivalences. These are uh, not uh, terribly difficult things to write down. Turn out to be equivalent. Let me say non mathematically again uh, in an easy way. OK, but for infinity 2, something funny happens. Sir? Yeah. So fibrant objects of those ones are quasi categories. <laughs> well, this is a little bit of a <laughs> uh, uh, of a uh, tautology once again. But uh, you, do you know anything about quasi categories? Should I say? Okay. Um, so one marked simplicial set. So you mark uh, only one. Simplicities, and so and, uh, you know you have a simplicial set and some marking, and so I need to tell you, w uh, do I restrict uh, for fibrant objects the simplicial sets? And yes, I do. So fibrant objects uh, again quasi categories, but now you uh, on the underlying simplicial sets, but uh, uh, what you marked are plus uh, equivalences in a quasi category marked. And if you don't quite remember what an equivalence in a quasi category is, I am coming to it in, a, uh, in a five minutes, I would say. Equivalences marked as, marked sim as thin simplices, thin one simplices. And uh, indeed, here uh, you can take, sorry, uh, yeah, here. Here, fibrant objects. Uh, once again, on, on the underlying simplicial sets, you will have quasi categories. And now I need to specify the marking everywhere plus, and then uh, it will be different for thin one simplices. And these are still one equivalences. And uh, as I said, uh, this n, so this one in this case is supposed to be the last level where some morphisms are supposed to be non-invertible. And so all the higher morphisms are supposed uh, to be invertible. And this is uh, indeed reflected in the model structure. So thin k simplices for k greater than 1 are going to be all simplices. So I had told you I have a subset. And this subset just happens to be everything. So this is uh, what happens uh, in 
in this model structure. So you have redundant information if you wish. And so it's easy to go from here to here, say, by just forgetting the redundant information. All simplices in dimension k. And this will be actually a common feature. So if I want to uh, make a model structure for infinity n categories, uh, I would expect for k gr greater than n, the, sim the simplices above dimension k in the, uh, in the fiber and objects to be all marked because they are supposed to encode equivalences. So back to Thomas' question, um, what about infinity 2? Like there you can do also different things. So there's a model structure for scaled simplicial sets due to Lurie, where you only mark something in dimension two, which is supposed to be like equivalence uh, for scaled simplicial sets. And due to Lurie, there's the one which I just presented to you, mark simplicial sets infinity two. And, uh, Actually, this is uh, older than what I want to say in a second. So this is uh, equivalent due to a nice theorem by um, Ganya, Harpas, and Lanari. And then there is uh, something on Marx. Uh, you know, you can ask once again, what are the fiber and objects here? Can I see this already on the underlying? Uh, simplicial sets, and this is indeed true. This is once again, it's kind of combination of what Lurie says and what Ganya Halpas and Lanari say. So, um, vibrant objects um, can be detected already on the underlying simplicial sets. on underlying simplicial sets. I would say this is a combination of what Lurie says and what Daniel Harpers and Lanari showed for you. But there is a problem with this. And uh, let me say this once again informally. So in, uh, if you think about this model category, what it encodes for you is uh, uh, infinity two categories together with pseudomorphism, more or less, between them. So you have some notion of morphism between two categories. And it's supposed to be, of course, a weak notion because you cannot uh, encode something strict in a, a model category like this. So uh, what you should think about is infinity two categories with pseudo uh, morphisms or pseudo two uh, functors. And I think this is a no go theorem. I would assign this to Matt Feller, but uh, you can uh, make precise statement about this. If you look just at uh, mapping uh, spaces between uh, those. Uh, Underlying uh, those um, sim simplicial sets, there's not a good way of saying in model category uh, uh, language what a pseudo two functor would be in there. So, uh, so um, function spaces or mapping spaces between x and y for two simplicial sets. Underlying fibrant objects in of scaled simplicial sets, fibrant objects I would say this cannot uh, carry uh, as a model categorical term um, the structure of pseudo two functors. What it does more uh, morally speaking, these are like lux two functors. And once again there's you know uh, up to some coherent homotopy something. But uh, what it, uh, you, uh, once you don't record the scale to simplices, once you don't ask the equivalence to morphisms to go to equivalences, uh, this uh, in model category structure cannot tell you the, to do this exactly. 
And so I don't think there's a model structure on scaled simplicial, uh, sorry, on simplicial sets, which is equivalent to the one on scaled simplicial sets. I don't know whether this exists. I think it should be there, but I, I don't have a statement for you there mathematically. But this, you know, this could exist. I think there uh, I could, uh, you know, if uh, I could maybe prove a no-go theorem for that. Okay. Thank you for the question. Sorry, yeah. The uh, sorry, those two are equivalent. Or what did you say? Can you do this? Uh, I, uh, well, uh, you know, I need to reread re Gania Hapas Lanari, but they can do it. And uh, I think, you know, I could do this too. <laughs> no, I'm. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Any more questions? Okay, so what about, uh, yeah, so uh, now I told you this theorem and I told you some indication of why it's kind of true. And let me tell you another theorem which tells you that it's actually true. So this is, uh, one, uh, it's based on uh, something Martina and I did and then it was finished by Felix Le Baton. Um, and so let me formulate this first in a model categorical language, and then I will comment how to relate to this uh, um, infinity categorical language. So there's a, a left quorn functor. Uh, I was, we were running out of letters, so it's called L. Um, so it's going from the category of theta n spaces. I've not told you at all what this is. Let me, uh, and I will not do it. And there's also a small star on this. Uh, I will tell you in a set, uh, well, if you're interested, I can tell you about the star to mark simplicial sets with infinity n model structure. So I told you it should be left quillant functor, so I'd rather have a model structure on either side, uh, which is equivalent equivalence, which Okay, so this is a strict mathematical statement. Let me uh, dwell upon the meaning of the, the statement. Um, so let me first say something towards theta n spaces. I will not define this for you, but this is an established model structure. And uh, so in particular, Bali and Choma Priest show um, it's um, with underlying infinity category being uh, underlying inf infinity category modeling infinity and uh, categories. So, um, so uh, first part of, uh, of this theorem is something Martina and I did, and uh, it's uh, hard, I would say technically somewhat non-trivial to show uh, that you indeed produce a left quillant functor in here, and you need a lot of understanding of this model structure on infinity and categories in order to um, know that uh, this indeed produces for your left quillant functor. And then Felix, uh, building upon this, and in particular, using one of the uh, techniques we uh, developed in the course of this, Felix Le Baton was able to show that this left quillant functor is indeed equivalent equivalence. So uh, in particular, uh, given that we have equivalent equivalence and we know the left-hand side models the right uh, infinity category, then the right-hand side models the right infinity category. And in particular, uh, now it, this uh, statement makes more a more precise sense. So uh, now there's both an intuitive sense to this, but also a precise sense, if you wish. Um, OK. So this tells you uh, this can be taken as a model for infinity n categories. And I said this is more convenient. Uh, so one uh, way of seeing this is, well, the model, uh, the underlying category of this, well, I told you what this is. It was, I would say, reasonably short. And you 
uh, it was staying the same for all n, whereas here the underlying category varies with n and it grows with n, I would say, pretty fast. Um, you know, in the case n equals 1, that you actually recover quasi uh, no, no uh, not quite quasi category, complete zero spaces, uh, but this is close enough, so uh, recovers known. setups for infinity one categories. But uh, for uh, n equals, uh, so uh, let me comment on infinity two case because this was our model case. So there, uh, like the functor was not there yet. Um, what uh, existed before was uh, this equivalence due to Gani uh, Havas Lanari, which uh, was based on the model of scale simplicial sets. And once again, I don't have a no go theorem there, but uh, it seems to be very much restricted to the case n equals to 2. And uh, instead, uh, this is something which we did joint with Julie Bergner. So there we pr also produced this left quern functor, and this left quern functor was kind of a blueprint for higher dimensional ones, L for n equals 2. And there you could use a technique developed by Clark and uh, Chris uh, Schomer-Pries in order to uh, show that, well, once you know the equivalence by Ganya habas lanari you can actually get also an equivalence for this functor L without uh, Louboutin's work. And then, uh, you know, the, the, given this blueprint, we were able to show the high dimensional cases. Um, questions so far? What star again? Star? Okay. Uh, this is a really technical point. <laughs> so, um, you know, uh, in, uh, in uh, the uh, model structure for theta n spaces, you need to do something like. Um, you take injective model structure on, uh, well, if you do this actually in model categories, the spaces are can't simplicial, can't uh, model structure on simplicial sets. You take some, uh, an injective model structure on some um, um, diagram category and then you localize with respect to a bunch of stuff. Um, so this is, and then localized uh, with respect to, um, I don't know, uh, some set of, Morphisms localized. So this is what the original model structure I didn't say. So uh, due to risk uh, was and what I denoted uh, ten cent. And for technical reasons, we need uh, it to use a slightly different but uh, equivalent model structure, and we need to do the projective model structure on this. Um, diagram category first and then localize with res respect to the very same set of map. And you know, it's not surprising. It's going to give you an equivalent model structure, so the same underlying infinity category. But technically, it's a different thing. So we needed to do this. So this is the star. Okay. More questions? Okay, um, then uh, I promised you to talk about equivalences and this is maybe uh, my plan now, sorry. I'm supposed to do this. Yeah, so uh, like Thomas, I'm also very much in favor of this wet cleaning in order for students to have a break. On the other hand, students always complain that during the break, I'm already starting the, to explain the next thing. OK, so what's an equivalence in a higher category? Um, we need um, 
some notion of unfordability. So first, let me go fluffy again. So uh, in a fluffy sense, I would like to have some one morphism. You know, you can do this for higher morphisms as well, and it makes total sense, but let's start somewhere. Uh, so I have a one morphism, and I would like to say, well, uh, I have some kind of inverse such that fg is somehow related to identity of y. I would uh, use some uh, symbol in between those, and gf is somehow related to identity of x. But uh, both of them, uh, both of the symbols are not quite defined yet, so I want some kind of equivalence between those. This typically leads me into trouble, um, but uh, I can try to do something like this. So how do I encode, uh, how do I make this precise? So there's something in quasi categories which you have probably or possibly already encountered. Um, so in quasi categories you can make this precise by the fo following feature. Um, you can take first a strict one category encoding for you what it means to be invertible. So I will uh, look at the following strict one category. I have two objects x and y and I have a morphism f uh, between them. And well, in one category, in just usual categories, there's, there's only one sense of uh, being invertible, namely, uh, you know, invertible meaning f composed with f to minus one is going to be identity, and f minus one composed with f is going to be an identity. This is all I can do in one category. This gives me some uh, group point. I can take the nerve of this so for, uh, and uh, any reasonable model of infinity one categories should come with such a nerve. So it uh, should produce, for me, I started with some one category. Well, indeed, it was even a group poet. So a zero category, if you, uh, sorry, uh, one, one one category, if you wish. Um, but, uh, and then infinity one categories, once again, in uh, any reasonable model should sit inside infinity n categories. OK, uh, so I can then uh, look at this infinity n category and let me call it something. Maybe at, at the moment I will first uh, start with this j being an infinity 1 category. Um, so what does uh, this guy mean? So an equivalence in an infinity category. And this is, I think this is a theorem due to Riau, but maybe it's also Going back uh, even to Bob Bartman and Fogg, today I'm not completely sure uh, on what's happen what happens happened there. So a morphism which I can classify by a map one into my infinity one category. And let me be precise. I want to be a model uh, and in a quasi category is a, an equivalence if and only if it lives. So I have my morphism f inside of j if it admits a lift like so. And uh, the th so, uh, okay, this would be a definition. And the theorem is though you can actually, so this is an infinite amount of data. Nerve of j is a highly infinite simplicial set. But uh, you can actually test this uh, on much smaller amount of information. This is something which is the theorem of Riel. So you uh, can also test this by saying, OK, my f is supposed to have some kind of uh, right, uh, sorry, left inverse and some kind of left inverse. Uh, Sorry, I think I said left twice. Uh, I want two different sides. Um, so if I have compositions like so, I have f composed with h, homotopic to identity, and uh, g composed with f, homotopic 
to identity. And now inside of quasi category, this makes precise sense. Uh, this uh, tells me already my morphism was invertible. And this can be taken as a definition in, in, uh, in a quasi category. And the uh, question is, what can we actually say about uh, infinity n categories? So in a quasi category, in infinity one category, you can uh, do this. Um, in infinity n categories, you have ways of saying one n equivalences. And something which is really interesting, but uh, I don't have time to uh, deal with, in strict n categories, is much less clear. And uh, it's an interesting question, which we're uh, trying to tackle right now. Um, less clear what to uh, do. And so this is something which is work in progress, and uh, uh, which I'm uh, happy to comment uh, after, uh, if you ask me uh, in the break or so what to do. OK, so uh, I think uh, that's it for the moment. Thank you. Mark some social set. Okay, let me think about this for a second. Um, so they do form a bi category, right? Mm -hmm. So this uh, works then. So um, this is actually closely related to the notions of equivalence. So maybe let me phrase, uh, you know, there are different versions of this theorem. But in any case, two categories. So I would say strict two categories first. Uh, and then uh, you can also go to bi categories. Both of them uh, embed. So there's a homotopically fully faithful embedding. Uh, so two, both two categories and bi categories embed into uh, infinity two categories. And uh, I think this is true. OK, so uh, um, for Mark simplicial sets, uh, I think the first embedding was produced by us. And uh, then in other uh, contexts, you can also produce an embedding uh, as, Jonas, uh, sorry, as Alexander Campbell did. Um, and uh, there's also something due to Ganya Hapasar Lanari. Um, and, uh, to Lynn Moser, uh, let me write this down. So this is saying um, um, all of those are producing something in a specific model. And uh, you know, we are, uh, as I said, it's dearest to my heart. We're m m working with a model of marked simplicial sets. So uh, that tells you how to go from here to here in terms of marked simplicial sets. Um, so you uh, and basically the underlying simplicial set will be just the nerve of uh, your category of uh, bimodules. Uh, well, uh, there's a little bit of a, a lie because you need to distinguish between two categories and uh, bi categories. But uh, otherwise, you can uh, you take your favorite category uh, and you take its nerve. But then uh, the magic is more or less in this marking being exactly related to the equivalences I was talking about. Um, so um, this is something uh, we did, uh, and uh, then you need to, uh, you know, yeah, I gave you a bunch of different embeddings from here to here. You would like to know this: uh, all embeddings uh, are the same, and this is something which, you know, was foreshadowed, I would say, by Gebner and Haug saying, but was fleshed out by us. So any embedding you can actually take on the level of model structures will give you the same embedding of infinity uh, categories. There's a, uh, up to uh, the, the 
changes which uh, uh, Clark and uh, Chris have uh, already foreseen, so more or less any reasonable embedding is the same. Uh, you can say more precisely what reasonable means. It's a mathematical statement behind this. Thank you.